Hello, everyone. Can everyone who's staying please take a seat? We'd appreciate that. Trotsky? Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Feldman, uh, the president of NATB, and I'm very excited to uh, bring you this session this afternoon. Um, these people uh, represent a lot of our uh, TV stations in this country, and they have a lot to say about the health of those stations, and, and many of us think that 2012 is going to be a banner year. So we want to, I want to thank all of you for coming, but I especially want to thank Harry and the people at TV News Check and also our friends at Rentrack. And I want to remind all of you that after the panel, there will be uh, libations served back there at the bar. And then I also want to remind you that after you have a drink or two here, we will have our opening night party around the pool this evening as well. So again, thank you to Rentrack and thank you to, to uh, TV News Check. And Harry, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rick. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about what's happening in the TV business, which is the oldest part of the business, but that shouldn't, sometimes old has a pejorative sense, especially when you're at a conference which everybody's talking about new media. But the fact is, this is the oldest and the most vital segment of the TV business still. Uh, it's, it has, uh, TV stations have the most watched programming, and study after study shows that TV stations are the number one source of news for Americans. Uh, in political season, you see where the political money goes, 80 cents out of every dollar goes to TV stations. So this is still a very important part of, TV, uh, of the TV world. Don't get distracted by all that stuff you see at CES. It's the TV station world. Um, for our discussion here today, we have assembled heads of five of the TV station groups. Collectively, if my arithmetic is right, they uh, manage about hundred, uh, more than 100 stations and have one point, more than $1.6 billion in revenue, which I think is about 10 or 12 percent of the entire business. Let me start by introducing them from my far left. Paul Karpowitz, President, Meredith Local Media Group. Perry Sook, Chairman, President, CEO, Nextstar Broadcasting. Deborah McDermott, President, Young Broadcasting. Brian Lawler, Senior Vice President of Television at EW Scripps. And Vince Sadusky, Lynn Media President and CEO. Um, so last year I did a panel with uh, several of their peers. I'm going to start with the same question I asked them. And the question is, what, going into 2012, what is your biggest challenge? I just want to start with Paul and come down the road. What is the biggest challenge you're facing, the industry is facing in 2012? Right now I think the biggest issue that, that we have to deal with day in and day out is the economic instability that's out there. I think there's still a lot of uncertainty. I don't think consumer confidence is where it needs to be. Uh, you know, certainly you hear a lot of rhetoric during the debates and during this political season. But I think if we could get to some certainty as it relates to the economy, it would just, it would just generate housing starts, generate more retail sales, generate more activity. Automotive continues to be very strong, which is great. But by the same token, you have to always look in the rearview mirror because there was a time when our automotive business just fell off the table. So I, I just think my biggest concern or, or wish would be that we would have some stability in the economy that we would know and be able to predict down the road. Well, so that's a, those are forces really beyond your control. Is there anything in the media world that you see as a challenge that something, put in another, other terms, what you would like to do or you know, as you plan your year, what can you do? What do you see as a challenge to be overcome in your business that you have some control over? Well, and, and again, let me, I'll, I'll throw out another one, just another challenge, which we do have some degree of control over, but not completely. That's Washington. And, and the forces in Washington that want to take our spectrum away and so forth. But to, if you want to bring it back down to station level stuff that you can do, one of the things that I think we all have to think about is the relationship between our advertisers and our sellers and make sure that that relationship is as strong as it could be and to the extent that we can do a better job of training our salespeople, equipping them so that they're out there able to sell multi-platform packages. You know, the salespeople of 20 years ago could not survive in this environment. So we have to create salespeople that I think that are adept at selling across multiple platforms selling different metrics and having a relationship that can cross over different types of agencies, different types of clients, and different types of budgets. Perry? 
Well, first of all, I think the things that I worry most about are the things that are out of our control, event risk, macroeconomic factors, and things like that. You know, I think you get back to the what our business is at its core. It's a local service business that services a local community. We produce local content and we uh, provide the delivery mechanism for advertisers' messages, and that's really what we do. The third thing we do, which is why we're all here, is we distribute programming that we don't own, you know, for, to, to our, our viewership uh, generally on a market-exclusive basis. So I think that from our perspective, you know, where we've made our investments in the last year is in increasing the amount of local content, increasing the number of people in our newsrooms, even in this environment, by programming more of the broadcast day and more of our online content with things that we create and author locally. Uh, we've made an investment, uh, continuing investment in our e-media platform, uh, in people, e-media platform and, and uh, all of the, the elements of that as another delivery mechanism for local advertiser messages and local content. Um, I, I think, though, uh, when you look at how the, the business model has evolved for television, you know, people always talk about this business and its challenges, but when I started my, this company in 1996, we had two revenue streams. We sold commercials, and the networks paid us a little bit of money to air their commercials, um, which was called Network Comp. We look at the model now. We have the, the traditional ad channel, and you're right, it's still the lion's share of the revenue and the lion's share of the EBITDA. You have an e-media channel, uh, a mobile channel that, that is in various stages of development, a distribution revenue stream, and then you know every other year, every even-numbered year, depending on your affiliation, and uh, maybe not depending on your affiliation, you have this uh, wonderful influx of revenue for political ads, Olympic ads, and, uh, and Super Bowl uh, and things like that, which I call kind of special events. It's recurring, but not recurring every year uh, to the order of magnitude of the, of the political advertising. So I think our, our economic model is more diversified and stronger than it ever was, and it's all about execution. I think at this point at the local level, and that and that's all about people, and those are the two areas where I think most of us spend a lot of our time is on people issues and execution issues. Deb. Deb. <clears throat> my greatest challenge next year is also, I think, my greatest or our company's greatest opportunity, and that is that we need to extend our brand into the multi-platform world. We need to then maximize and, and try to you know, garner re revenue off those multi-platforms, and that's going to be a big focus, a big focus for our company. And I, and I believe along with that, uh, the opportunity here is I, I feel like we have, you know, we've been through the recession, we've seen two years of recovery, um, and I think it's a very exciting time for us to grow our business, to, to, to look forward, and I think the important part of that is leadership. And I think that we need to be looking for the entrepreneurial part of our business. We were, uh, uh, we've, we've automated everything we can automate almost. <laughs> we've we've uh, um, kind of uh, right-sized our companies as we went through the, the difficult time. And now, uh, you know, we've re redone all of our studios and, and all of our stations are now totally HD in every, in every area and we've automated a lot of systems. So now we don't have to worry about all those things. Now we need to step forward and really pursue um, how do we be better at what we're doing? How can we be um, entrepreneurial? How can we be innovative? Um, how can we be more creative? And, and that takes leadership in your organization and at the top of your organization you know, with your general managers. And I think that's the exciting part about us going forward. Okay, Brian. You know, it's interesting if you listen to um, uh, Paul and Perry and, and Deborah here. Um, it, there's a key here. They keep talking about people, and that's the thing that really can make us different. You know, Paul talked about we need great sellers who can serve advertisers' needs, who are creative and uh, innovative, who can make differences. Um, you know, Perry talked about the content, and uh, you know, having uh, storytellers, uh, people who are curious, people who you know are committed to community and making communities better by telling stories uh, that are unique and get a lot of d discourse coming. And then, of course, Deb talked about um, leadership. We need great leaders, uh, leaders who can are not afraid to take risks, who are willing to uh, you know challenge the way we've done business for a long time, um, and uh, you know uh, uh, aspire to make our communities better. And I agree. I think that you know every day, if we can find great people. All of those things are things within our control that can allow us uh, to be more successful and create a really dynamic business moving forward. I think you know the other thing um, that I would say as an industry will be a challenge for us moving forward is just the ongoing need for accurate measurement. We're all investing in great uh, mobile technologies and digital technologies. Um, 
in, in connected uh, opportunities. And so the ability for us to be able to uh, acknowledge exactly how many people are consuming our product on all of those different platforms, then we can monetize it. But without being able to answer that question accurately, we have a hard time engaging an audience <clears throat> and monetizing it. And so Does that I think, include the broadcast platform? Well, to some degree. Still. I mean, the, you know, the more accurate, the better. And so we continue to push for uh, the best measurement uh, services possible. But especially as you get into you know, over the top inside house and mobile and all those kinds of things, we've got to know who's consuming, where they're consuming, and how long they're consuming. Uh, because there's an audience that will pay for that. And we've got to make sure that we have the opportunity to monetize that. How about you, Vince? Yeah, look, I, I think everybody summed it up really, really well. I don't have a lot to add. I think if you would ask that question a few years ago, quite honestly, I would have said, you know, I'm losing sleep at night about about the health of the ecosystem, about not having a dual revenue stream, about the potential for sports programming to migrate on over to ESPN, about uh, all sorts of new uh, value-added uh, uh, digital services that have incredible tracking capability that are uh, kind of kind of chipping away at our business, et cetera. I think today where we sit, we feel pretty good. I mean, our company and a lot of these companies have had their best cash flow ever in 2010. We'll report their best odd-year cash flow ever in 2011. The diversity of the revenue stream is completely different. It's not 99% reliant on, on television advertising. I think the business is very, very healthy, and I feel better about the overall ecosystem than ever before, and I would really echo everybody else's feedback. My biggest concern is not monumental, kind of earth-shattering industry issues. It's really around finding terrific creative people and people that uh, really understand uh, how, how digital works and, and are really curious about, uh, about, about digital. Because you have to know, you have to understand, I think, I think who your competition is and you have to understand what those opportunities are. It's no longer just, you know, just a single medium uh, speak. It just occurred to me that for the, for the people uh, are with publicly traded companies, and you're very optimistic, as uh, I would expect you to be, why do you have so much trouble communicating that to the investment community, to Wall Street, which sort of does see you as an old-fashioned, yesterday's kind of news. Uh, I think it's reflected in some of the stock prices, too. Perry, you I, go. Or, I don't think there's any question that we're undervalued. I think if you look at, at the multiples where uh, public companies are trading, it's, it's crazy. And, and I know that continues to be a challenge. And we work very hard at trying to convert analysts and, and convince them that this is an exciting time in our industry and that there is, uh, you know, a future in digital and mobile and so forth. Um, in many cases, you know, our company is made up of a broadcast group and a publishing group. And it's, it's very difficult to kind of work through that balance. So... Well, that's... But uh, here's a pure play. Uh, Perry is all TV. What's, uh, what, what, what's Wall Street not get? Um, I think it's the, uh, the fear of the future and the fear of the unknown, you know, it's uh, uh, to, to a certain extent as people are valuing they say, well, where are we going to be in five years? I go back to when I started my first company in 1991 and I had a bank tell me, well, we're not going to lend to network affiliated TV stations anymore because cable is going to put them out of business. And so here, fast forward, you know, more than 20 years and it's been a different threat of the month. Mark Cuban did a wonderful speech that talked about local television and what television was actually, you know, uh, for, and he said it's a perfect antidote to, an anecdote to boredom. So he said uh, it will always have a place. People will watch TV, and he calls a lot of these things you see at CES the one-hit wonders, you know, that become buzz, that become noise, and they're interesting but not really meaningful. If you go back to what I said earlier, what do we do? We produce local content. We sell stuff for local advertisers. That's a local service business. Uh, the fundamentals of what we do haven't changed. We spend a whole lot of time talking about how we do it. Is it over the top? Is it mobile? Is it online? Is it over the air through a distribution channel? And you know, but it doesn't change the nature of the business. And uh, listen, I, at the time my company has been public since 2003, we went from a, an all-time high stock uh, a close of $15 to an all-time low of 50 cents. And that happened within 18 months of one another. Um, and then we're a little, little better than half the way back, you know, to where the, the, the median is between the high and the low. So I think that um, uh, a lot of the television business gets defined at the network level. And I would argue that we're in a little bit different business serving local communities. We're much more like a regional sports network than we are a 
uh, you know, a national entertainment play, and we're really defined by our local content and our uh, national content partners. What uh, the other peer play here is uh, Vince, uh, all TV stations. Uh, what's what's the pushback do you get? Yeah, I think I think the um, for for me the the answer is scale. It's just a lack of scale. I mean, just think of your own personal portfolios now, right? I mean, everybody's really concerned about growth, still very concerned about the economy. After everything we went through in 2008 and 9, every investor I talked to is like, well, you know, and I'm really heavily invested in cash, heavily invested in bonds. I'm still lukewarm towards equities, and the equities I do invest in are blue chip Fortune 500 companies because that's high quality. I know they're going to be around. So I think, I think at the moment, you know, as long as you have this kind of investor glass half full mentality, I think, uh, you know, if you have the market cap of all of us, including valuing the private companies at a, at a, at a public multiple, you'd have less than a billion dollars in market cap here for some of the largest of television broadcasts. I think that's, that's a, a significant issue. So we need, a, we need another round of consolidation? I think that, that would be helpful. That would help. Which, which gets us back to Washington, right? Which isn't going to let that happen, or not very easily. Not, I, I don't see that in the short term. I don't see them opening their arms and saying, well, go ahead, guys. Uh, you can get as many TV stations as you want in a market. But, but the reality is we should. We should have the ability to do that. Well, let's talk about these uh, uh, revenue streams. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Deb here. What, looking out the next five years, honestly, how quickly can you, or how, what do you see the, the growth rate for, for a station group over the next five years? I mean, can they do more than two or the two or three percent we were talking about uh, beforehand? Yeah, they're not taking into consideration what we do during a political year. We'll be up 10, 12 percent during a political year, and then we might be up, you know, four or five percent, three to five percent on the off political year, um, if you, in base revenue. So base base revenue. Let me let me go back because base revenue is is basically rather consistent. You know, it's up. You know, in a, a non-political year, you could have base revenue up, you know, five percent. In a political year, depending on how much political demand you have, it could be anywhere from minus one to plus three. You know, it could be somewhere somewhere in that range. But it is, it takes a hit. Uh, but if you kind of spread that, you know, across the, the two years, it's much better than the two two to three percent that you're hearing from analysts. Um, you know, it's it's much more positive than that. It's. What do you, what do you see it as, Brian? What are you saying? Yeah, I agree. I think um, the industry is, uh, you know, performing better. Obviously, you know, this two-year cycle is real. Um, you know, it artificially uh, inflates our numbers uh, very positively, you know, in the even years, and then, you know, kind of settles back down. But all the, um, uh, you know, challenge of uh, trying to uh, accommodate the advertising and all uh, puts some pressure, and, and so. You know, we work with our regular advertisers around the displacement there. But I think, you know, there's tremendous opportunity, especially for television stations like ours, the ones that are in um, the local news business, to be able to really, you know, focus on community and grow our, our uh, share of voice within that market. And I think that presents a great opportunity where, you know, a rating point is millions of dollars for any one of us in any one of our markets. And so even in a market that's, you know, maybe up only 2 or 3 percent with the, the you know, diversification now of our revenue streams, and it's so much more than just selling spots anymore. It's retrans, it's multicast, it's, um, you know, mobile, digital, all that. You know, all of those are seeing double-digit uh, percentage increases on an annual basis. It's still a pretty small part of the big uh, It's not insignificant anymore. I mean, it's not broadcast, but um, I think it's growing pretty well, and, and that'll continue to allow our, our television stations uh, and our companies to uh, well exceed total revenue of 2 to 3%. So why this, uh, this is a programming conference, so let's talk a little bit about programming. Why the resurgence in first-run syndication? I, I, you know, I can't, we started TV News Check six years ago, and, you know, we sort of saw, a, a, you know, a, a decline in the syndication business. There just didn't seem to be much excitement around it. Nothing, not a lot was happening. It was turning into sort of an off-network business. Suddenly we have five pretty high-profile shows, and I'm sure that each of you have picked up one or the, two of these new shows, uh, what do we have, Steve Harvey, Katie Couric, Ricky Lake, Jeff Probst. Uh, why the, what's happening out there? Why all of a sudden? All Oprah? Is it all about Oprah? Well, I think you've got networks uh, that are giving back day, daytime time periods well, to helps. the affiliates sure. to program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, has, for a while it was ABC a supply then. demand yes. problem. Um, I think you've got uh, incumbent shows like an Oprah that have gone away, that obviously there's time period availability there. 
Um, I think you also, you know, we, we go through cycles and I think we, uh, we have produced every court show concept that there is to be produced. I'm sure somebody has a, has a different opinion on that. But, so, um, and I think a lot of it is talent and availability. So, uh, I, you know, it's a very derivative and imitative business. And if somebody sees the opportunity to have success, and then there'll be spin-offs to that. So, uh, I think just, it's It's just the talk show's turn for a little resurgence. Well, yep. also, there was a, a, you know, a couple of years there where no, there was very little development just because of the economy and, and the time periods. Now there's, you know, a, you know, the Oprah time period and the, you talked about the afternoon time period on, on ABC, and then they all want to get into the pie. So you get, you get lots of development um, and competition for those time periods. Well, and the reality is all of those shows won't work. Yeah. I mean, we know that. History has proven that all of those shows won't work. Well, the good news is Sony's got Queen Latifah ready for you for well, but that's, <laughs> 2013. But, but if, if you have the one that does work, it's going to be around for a while. Long time. And, yeah. and that's what the bet is, that you're betting that you have the one that makes it, because then you can be looking forward to a you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten year run. And, and then you're successful. Yeah, but the odds are that the odds are against you. Uh, are against all these shows, really, that, uh, that they'll have you know, a successful third season. Maybe they you know, limp through a second season, but to get into a third season. Can anybody explain to me why you would want to be in this business? I mean, it, it really seems like a tough business to be in. To, when you to, hit to a home run. Show. Pardon? When you hit a home run. It's good. It, and it's good for a long time. So it's, it's sort it's of like a, playing it's poker. It's a franchise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we, I, I mentioned... Uh, uh, new media, and all, all you have uh, talked about it too. And mobile is a big part of it. And broadcasters have been attacking that in two ways: through the broadband with mobile apps, and through their own broadcasting-based what's what's known as mobile DTV. And I think we've been talking about it for two or three, maybe four years now. This idea that we're going to use a por small portion of the broadcast signal to broadcast. Uh, what I thought was going to be a simulcast of the basic signal, the broadcast signal, to mobile phones. But it hasn't happened. And um, I'm going to turn to Brian as a member of the uh, Pearl 9 which, uh, and, the, and mobile content venture to explain to me why haven't we seen more, uh, the, the more of development on this front? You know, I think there's been a ton of development. Um, it's taken some time and, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, technology issues. There's a, you know, chicken and egg thing that went on for a lot of years of, you know, who goes first, you know, do you build the products that have the, uh, the ability to receive a signal or do television stations put up a signal and so there needed to be, you know, somebody had to go first and ultimately the broadcasters did and I think what about 70 stations now, something like that, more than that. The, the signals are up there but yep. other big components of what they call the ecosystem aren't. We don't have, really don't have phones and we don't have a programming. Well, and, and I think there's a lot of those conversations happening now and I think you're beginning to see the development of those products. Um, I think there was a setback um, with the tsunami and some of the uh, challenges overseas that set back uh, the development of the chips, but I think T-Mobile right, has introduced that they're coming out with a phone uh, now that's hitting market now, um, which but is probably the first. But as you're sitting here today, you're telling us that this we're okay. Just give us a little more time. We're, we're, uh, yeah, we're I absolutely think it's coming, and I think it's going to be um, a great extension of the core business that we already have. The ability for us to be able to reach people when they're away from a television. And you know when we never used to be able to consider them consumers. Now to get them at any point as they're active in their lives, to have a you know live television on their hip in their minivan with the drop-down screens. I think it's a great opportunity for us to you know extend our brand and become even more meaningful in people's lives. There happens to be two. There's two separate groups pursuing this. One is the, called the mobile content venture, and then the other one is the mobile 500, which is uh, another big group of broadcasters. Uh, Vince is uh, part of that Mobile 500 group. What, what's happening on, the, on that front? Yeah, I think there's, there's a little confusion about, uh, about the various organizations. So first off, just to be clear, there's, there's an industry not-for-profit organization called the Open Mobile Video Coalition, made up of broadcasters, uh, 12 or 14 electronics manufacturers, chipset guys. It's a, it's a large, large, smart group of people that are vested into building out this ecosystem, and it's, it's hard. You know, it's just, there's a lot of players involved, and uh, it takes hardware, it takes software, it takes broadcasters, it takes content producers. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at, uh, at, at the landscape, I think uh, CES um, this year was, was a huge announcement. In fact, it was the headline the first day about the actual launch of, 
mobile television. So I think you know, we can argue and, and convince ourselves, which we're totally convinced of, that the engineering's right. Uh, this actually relieves the, a lot of the, the perceived backup and choking of broadband because it's broadcast. It's what broadcast does really well, delivers out to, to a lot of people all of us. It's a great signal. It's a great service. People are going to want it. They like it in Asia. They like it in Europe. But at the end of the day, people are waiting for, you know, to answer your question. You know, when is this thing going to get started? And I think at CES, it was a huge announcement. And Metro PCS is going to launch it. Samsung's making the phone, and it's going to be available in, uh, in a ton of markets simulcast. So I think that's, that's a pretty good, pretty good statement, pretty good place to get started. Well, I would be looking for AT&T or Verizon as opposed to Metro PCS. That's, that's uh, me. Yeah. No, I think that's, uh, that's a terrific goal. Uh, let's talk, get back to those revenue streams for a minute. The, uh, we talked about uh, advertising. Uh, the other one, the, the one that's really come out, uh, uh, grown over the last five years or six years, uh, retransmission consent. And that's looked like that was a beautiful thing. You go to the cable operator, you ask them you know, for a fee, goes right to the bottom line. But now the networks have come along and they want their cut of that money. Given the fact that the networks are now have your hand, their hand in your pocket, or, or they want to tap into that revenue stream, have we seen? Uh, is there no more? Is there any more upside in retrans? Is it all going to have to go back to the up, back to the network now? Uh, Perry, you're. Well, I think the, it can work two ways. I mean, first of all, is there is there upside growth in the absolute revenue stream of of retrans? Absolutely. You know, I'm said at an investor conference, I think that broadcast stations can get to $2 you know, per sub per month uh, because of their local content, because of their national content partnership or the network relationship. Uh, and I, whether that happens in the next two cycles or the next three cycles, I'm unclear, but there are constructive conversations going on. Brian and NBC uh, and, and the uh, affiliate board have been working for you know, some time now to try and develop a, a proxy concept where NBC would collectively bargain on behalf of all NBC affiliates with every MSO, much like ESPN does, or the Turner Networks, or, or any other video choice out there. And I think that can get us to $2 faster than we can under our own power negotiating MSO by MSO, market by market, and, uh, and, and that process. You know, I, I think there's probably further upside. I mean, I, as I said earlier, I think we're a lot like a regional sports network you know, like a Fox Sports Southwest or a Comcast, um, where we produce local content, and the regional sports networks today are getting about $3 and a quarter to $3.50 per sub per month. Um, and now we don't give two minutes back to the cable operator to sell, so we may not get to that kind of a top line revenue, but the whole concept of is there upside in retrans, you know, if the uh, <coughs> proposals that have been put forth, you know, were to come to fruition, you know, and I came to anybody in the room or anybody on the panel and said, listen, I, I've got an incremental revenue stream for you at a 50% margin. Are you interested? I think we'd all say, where do we sign? So I think it's, it can be a very good business going forward. And if you look at the, the viewership of broadcast television stations in an MVPD home, they collectively get about 40% of the viewership. And as of last year, we captured 5% of the distribution revenue. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge inequality in that, uh, a lot of reasons for it, but I expect the gap will close over time. So is, do, do you all agree that $2 is uh, doable? Oh, I, I definitely do. I think it is certainly in the, in the realm of possibility. And I think if you look at, as Perry indicated, you look at the viewership of, of our stations versus some of the cable channels, and then you look at, at what they're getting paid, and you know, there's speculation about what the new Disney deal is for ESPN and the Disney Channel and so forth. And you look at those numbers relative to the numbers that we're getting, and you say, why not? Why wouldn't we? You all agree? Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. It just depends on, we're not sure where that, that cycle happens for us. But, but I also think that, that we're not opposed to being partners with the networks and, 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 and sharing some of that, but as long as it's the right, the right division of revenue. Right. But that $2, well, they don't get greedy. That two dollars is over, the, as you say, the uh, next couple cycles, the next five or six, six, six years maybe. At, I mean, yeah. over a long term. We're not going to get there soon. Well, maybe. You got what you negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Vince, you're quiet. Do you, do you have a deal? Um, no, look, I deal? think uh, at the end of the day, these are all private negotiations, uh, you know, and 
really what we tell our investors just just look at the you know, look at the non-traditional revenue rolling up and you'll see it's getting really big uh, do we have any uh, questions from the floor I would like to talk about a, a, a different kind of programming, sports programming, that uh, NFL deal that uh, was just announced uh, extends uh, into the 2020s, is that right? I mean, a long-term deal. What's that mean to, um, to broadcasters? Is it, I thought it was a pretty big deal and sort of uh, cements uh, your, your place in the firmament. Uh, anyone want to comment on that? I just I think it's a great statement that the NFL realized that the greatest uh, value distribution for their product was exclusively on over-the-air broadcast. Um, there were plenty of cable networks that were interested in trying to acquire the rights away from us, and I think when they look at how they built uh, their franchises and, and their league, um, that's been on the on the backs of um, you know broadcast distribution, and uh, I think that they realized that the continued growth and uh, success of their league has a lot to do with people's ability to enjoy that in local communities on local television stations. And so I thought, uh, I thought it was a really great statement about uh, the value of local broadcast and what it's meant for uh, you know, one of the most successful industries in the country. Uh, Deb, I know you're a football fan. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the fact that ABC has dropped out of the pro game, what's that mean to you? I mean, is, is that a concern for the affiliates? Yeah. Yeah, we were very concerned when when they they dropped out of that and went over to to ESPN. The the, the consideration is we're we're not having we're having a harder time selling men numbers because we don't have them, male you know, whatever men numbers there are, and and that's a pie that you don't have access to. So if you don't if you don't have access to you know going into that sports pie, you're going to try to you know we do we do in some of our markets we do. Packers and and uh, Titans and try to do it, try to do some of that locally to get some of the, to get some of those dollars, but also I think that that I guess probably what um, concerns me even more is is to see some of the BCF stuff going to cable. You know, some of the college college I was college football. Um, I I just think it should be on broadcast. Uh, in uh, I guess the other big loss, the bowl games and lot. We still get some college football on, on ABC, but we lost the bowl games. And uh, what what else we lose uh, recently? Um, oh, the basketball, the yeah. March Madness, uh, yeah. CBS affiliates. What uh, what does CBS? I, I guess starting in 2016, we're going to lose the finals. It Turner. will rotate. Yeah, it will rotate off, and it will rotate with uh, with Turner. So, <coughs> what do you tell CBS, or what does CBS tell you about that? Well, I mean, it's the first year we've just completed the first cycle under this new arrangement, where you don't necessarily get every local game in your in your viewing area, and I think there's going to be a, a very tough discussion with the network as it comes time to redo the NCAA agreement, because fundamentally that package was built around the localism, the fact that. In Kansas City, I could have five local teams participating in the tournament, and I could almost count on having every one of those teams playing at a different time over, you know, over the course of the tournament. Under the present scenario, that doesn't exist anymore. You just basically get your national game. So I think that's going to require a lot of discussion trying oh, to figure so out. So that's, that's a separate issue. I was asking about losing the finals, but you're saying just get the, 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 the early round games that you Absolutely. want to get. That, to me, is actually more significant. Because right. there are more of those games, and you you know your chances of getting to the final are are much longer odds. But the you had a very good chance of having multiple teams just make it to the tournament, mm -hmm. and you take that piece out of consideration, and that just it fundamentally changes the way the deal is structured. Mm -hmm. Questions? Right yes, um, I want to uh, address this question first to Brian, and then uh, to the rest of the panel. Um, when, uh, when you were talking about new ideas, Brian, uh, you made a comment that uh, you're looking for entrepreneurship, you know, to get to the next level, and that uh, you want that entrepreneurship to tell new stories that make communities better. Yep. I think that there's a lot of, you know, we're all involved in one way, shape, or form in the, tele in the broadcast industry here, but, you know, when we go out into our communities and out into America, and we see some of this starting with the presidential campaign now, there's a great debate as to whether television makes, especially local television, makes communities better. Uh, and that debate is likely to intensify. 
Uh, and when you get from the broadcast group down to the general manager of that local station, there may also be a disconnect where that the broadcast group says, make communities better, and the GM says, I got to drive revenue however I have to drive revenue because I'm under pressure, whether it's Scripps or another broadcast group, you know, to, uh, to drive revenue. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk to local broadcasters at the local level, uh, they themselves are saying that they're being held back from doing good things to make communities better now. So where is the disconnect? It seems as though you have an ideal and an aspiration with, that is a great aspiration, and I think that's how television started out, you know, you know as a for-profit business, but also at the local level doing good things for communities. Right. Is there a disconnect in where we're going now, and how can we get better, uh, and how does television then compete with new media such as, pat dot, as patch dot com, which has as one of its uh, prime goals to make communities better and tell the positive stories of community. I, I think there's a sort of a fair question in that. Is that you know you talk you talk about you mm -hmm. know the, that first question we're going to do this we're going to train right. we're going to you know uh, do something more at the local level. But are you making, really making the investment? Because, what I, frankly, what I see is a, a lot of, you know, tr because of the recession, trying to take money, you know, a uh, uh, lot of automation, mm -hmm. taking people out of the stations. Um, somebody want to address that? Well, yeah, yeah. Brian, 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 you go Brian first. first yeah. Look, I think it's really uh, the core of what we do. We, uh, we're, we run news organizations. We have a license to serve and protect our communities, and I think we do have an obligation to make our communities better. Um, obviously, every you know, broadcast company comes at it a different way. I can tell you at Scripps over the last couple of years, we've had a real uh, focus on um, you know, producing quality uh, content, quality journalism that does get discourse you know, going in the community. We've reinvested in investigative units. Uh, you know, who else is going to hold people accountable if it's not us? You know, we're in states that are you know, bankrupt and cities that are corrupt. And you know, who else is going to hold business leaders, educators, um, politicians accountable. I think those are all parts of our responsibility. And so, you know, the, you know 2009 was a pretty difficult uh, challenge for all of us. You know, our company, we didn't lay anybody off, but, you know, we did use technology to free up roles to be able to put more feet on the street. Uh, we've trained people on multimedia journalists so that we can get deeper into the communities. And so we've got the same number of bodies that we had years ago, but we've got them deployed differently so that we can, in fact, build these multimedia businesses, um, that we can truly be 24-7, that we can be deeper in the communities. And if we've got that depth of coverage, then we can invest in things like investigative and consumer, those things that can really focus on the core issues that can make a community better. So um, I'll, I'll let these guys talk, but every company comes at it different. But from our company, do good by doing well is, you know, in our motto, and we try and live that every day, and we do think we can make a difference in our communities. Let's uh, get another question. We have some other people lined up here. Okay. All right. Thank you. I wanted to amplify the mobile DTV question and broaden it. Last week, uh, Needham and Company, uh, their chief media analyst, Laura Martin, issued a report on TV Everywhere and estimated that there could be 10 or $12 billion worth of additional ad revenue, most of that going to cable providers who are, seem to be closer uh, down their business model of providing TV everywhere than the broadcast industry itself through mobile DTV. Add to that new devices like Simple TV, which is an improvement over Slingbox. And it, it seems to me that the industry broadcasting should be concerned about other people skimming the cream off the operation because Needham's estimate is that there could be three or four billion dollars just from the most worrisome group, the potential cord cutters. Um, if you could get them to watch more out-of-home TV, which she estimates is very likely. Uh, my general question is, why isn't there an industry-wide full-court press to do what it takes to cut those revenue-sharing deals with the carriers and the uh, technology companies to make this happen and keep broadcasting in the driver's seat? I'm going I'm to throw this to Deb because we talked about this. Why? Why? And why can't this industry get itself together? And they, which they've done on mobile DTV, but get itself together to uh, try to exploit some of these other technologies uh, because they are complex. 
and it would, it would it, sometimes it does take a village to, to uh, figure out how to uh, monetize them, how, 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 to, how to go after them. You know, I think, I think that having gone through such a difficult time in the economy, we have, we've come out of that, and those are things that we really need to be doing that we're, that we're probably not doing as well as we, as we should. Um, and I think that, that cable is, you know, has, um, you know, they, they've got a smaller group. You know, we've got a lot of diverse companies, a lot of different types of companies, and, and the cable has a fewer, fewer number, and they have, I think, been very effective in, in their, uh, their, their working, as a, working as a unit. And I know the NAB is very, you know, works, on, works on some of these things, and there's groups getting together, but I believe that uh, we still have a ways to go. Who, who's on the NAB board? Anybody on the NAB board here? Yeah. Three of you? They are starting this broadcast labs uh, thing, uh, right. which, I, which I don't know very much about, but that's going to happen, right? It, it has happened. It has happened. We've, uh, we've put an individual in place. Kevin Gage is in charge of the broadcast labs. We've also, uh, as you know, we've kind of merged MSTV into the NAB technical group so that we brought over really some of the top engineers in the industry um, as part of the, the broadcast labs. So it is up and running. It is analyzing every proposal every new technology out there so to your to your question we are looking at that and and I hope that the NAB will be at the forefront of that and developing new technologies and and at least bringing things before the NAB board and the rest of the industry saying okay you need to be taking a very hard look at this how should we participate uh, well let me let me we have another question uh, let me just wrap up with this since we're on NAB in Washington uh, the whole TV spectrum uh, where the, the, the FCC's proposal to, to induce broadcasters to give back some of their spectrum and auction it off for broadband use. Uh, uh, the undertone of that, not so much an undertone, but the, maybe uh, uh, the overlay of that, is that broadband good, broadcasting <laughs> not so good. This is the message from Washington. Do you think, as publicly traded companies, do you think that hurts you? To, to see that kind of rhetoric come out of Washington? I don't think there's any question. I think the uncertainty that surrounds that is, is certainly a problem. And is, uncertainty? Is the uncertainty because what does it mean? What are the auctions going to generate? What does repacking look like? All of the questions surrounding that issue, we really don't know the answers. And the FCC has not been very clear about defining the parameters of what repacking would do, what kind of interference would be involved, and so forth. So, the uncertainty that, that we would all face in that scenario, I think, is what gets analysts nervous about the long-term future of, of broadcasting. Do, do, Brian, do you, you feel that uh, you have confidence that the NAB has this, at least this idea of the repacking and how that could impact the stations that don't want to become involved in the, the uh, auction? Do you think uh, the NAB has it under control with the, uh, the legislation that's popular? Yeah, you know, I have a lot of confidence in them, and obviously have worked closely with, you know, Paul and the executives at, uh, at the NAB. I, you know, it's still a scary proposition. We still wish it wasn't something we uh, had to address. Um, but I think we will, and I, I think we've tried to deal with it in, in, as best possible and trying to be fair and, and negotiate with these uh, folks to, you know, protect our interests. Again, we're not going to be able to serve communities if, the, if our signal isn't distributed. And so um, I think we'll you know, continue to work closely with the NAB and hopefully we get it right. I think we're in overtime. Time to kick a field goal. <laughs> hey, guys, uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, oh, uh, we do have a reception set up somewhere. Where is it? In the back? I see the bar over there. The bar is over there. So please stick around. Uh, Rentrack TV News Check sponsoring some drinks and some refreshment. Uh, thanks. Uh, join me in thanking the panel for it.